Hello and welcome to issue one of Bagged and Boarded. I'm Jasmine, that Bronze Girl Bular, and I am your host for today's episode. Now here on Bagged and Boarded, you know, I try to focus a little bit on comic books themselves, but I also discuss how those tie into and play with other forms of media like movies and shows, specifically things that are outside of the MCU because I already have a show where I talk about MCU stuff. Hello and welcome. Welcome to chat. Welcome to my cat who has decided now of all times to uh, get on my desk and create havoc. Before we get into news from San Diego Comic-Con, we're gonna talk about what I've been reading this week. Now, all of these comics aren't like brand spanking new because I have a life, but you know, they're, they're, they're he here. First up is a image book called Blood Stained Teeth. This isn't the newest one, actually. This one is the, f I think this week the fourth one came out, but number two was the one that just happened to be the one that was on my desk. <laughs> so, you know, here we are. Uh, it's also my favorite cover, a little bit, of the ones I've read. Bloodstained Teeth has actually really cool premise. It's kind of blade-like in that there's like, these vampires that exist that are pure blood vampires and then there's vampires that are converted and they're called i think uh drips or something like that and <laughs> this this piece of shit vampire has made money from ac accepting bribes from people for turning them into vampires like they basically pay him and then he turns them into vampires. Because who wouldn't pay to become a vampire, right? You get to live forever, all this stuff. Tons of people pay to do it. Now, he's in trouble with the OG vampire Illuminati for converting all these people. And he has to go kill all of them or de-vampire them, whatever you want to call it. Or he's the one that's going to get whacked. It's actually a very interesting book. I like it a lot. So it's basically this vampire going around dealing with all of the vampires he's turned. One of the vampires he has to go take out is a boxer that has, that has uh, kind of uh, funny things on its own. I really like the art style. As you can tell from the cover, it has a very unique art style. It, the colors are really saturated. There's a lot of like... It almost gives like a 70s type of feel uh, when you flip through it. And so that's what I read this week that I liked. I should say there's things I read this week that I just, not that I didn't like them, I just didn't feel like there was anything worth commenting on. These are just kind of the standouts of the week or interesting in such a way that I wanted to talk about it. Next up, and I guess this is actually the first part of this event came out today. That's a lie, it would have been this Wednesday. It came out this week. But this is the prelude to it. Um, Devil's Reign, Omega. Ba ba ba. Okay. I have a love hate relationship with this book. I don't know why. Basically, what's going on is Luke Cage is the mayor of New York, which is actually a really interesting change of direction for the character. And uh, Wilson Fisk has been ousted as the mayor of New York and now Luke Cage is coming in and kind of fixing everything and so this is how Devil's Reign is kind of beginning okay that part of it I actually really like um because it has a lot of allegories for a post-Trump administration I, I I'm not I'm not joking it's like there's all of these people that are pro-Fisk and they're kind of doing insurgency stuff and they're undermining the election and saying that Luke Cage isn't the real mayor of New York and they're trying to basically bring Fisk back. Does that sound familiar to you guys? I I don't know. Just just asking. Does that does a bunch of insurgents storming up the Capitol building steps and saying that, you know, this is this is a scam? Does that seem familiar <laughs> to y'all and then people will try to say comics aren't political girl comics have always been political so i actually like that side of it because i find it to be a very interesting 
uh, sort of allegory. I also find it interesting for Luke Cage to balance being a mayor versus being just, you know, a superhero that punches people in the mouth. Of course, uh, our, our wonderful Daredevil is teamed up with Elektra. After faking his own death, using his brother's death as a cover. So Daredevil's brother, Matt Murdock's brother is dead. He uses his funeral to kind of pretend that he's died instead. And he thinks it's better, sorry about that. He thinks it's better if the world thinks Matt Murdock is dead so that he can take out the hand. And these are the events. This is the setup for, for Devil's Reign. The Daredevil comics have actually been kind of fire for a while, so. Um, I recommend checking them out because we're just about, or we just started, I should say, a really interesting sort of event um, that's probably a good time to jump on, if I'm being honest. This is another image book. I don't know, man. I just end up reading a lot of image comics. They're my favorite. I mean, first of all, just look at this cover. It's called The Closet. You know I like it when I put it in a Mylar bag. That's how, you, that's how you know I like it. Otherwise, I put it in the cheap bag. So, the closet, I don't know how I feel about it yet, but usually I will read most runs, unless I hate them, for two to four issues before I let them go or, you know, keep keep reading them. Um, this has This comic has one of the most uncomfortably realistic couple fights I've ever seen. <laughs> There's <laughs> there's a couple that fights in, <laughs> in this issue, like at the very beginning. It is so <laughs> uncomfortable because I feel like I've heard couples having this argument, fam. Like it's basically old boy uh, is supposed to go out and get box tape. Okay. Supposed to go out and get box tape because they are moving. All right. And he stops by the bar on the way home and ends up, he says, I'm going to have one drink, ends up having more than one drink at the bar, eventually gets home. Girl, he, his wife is trying to pack up their apartment so he can move. He gets home late, drunk with, without box tape. He gets like scotch tape or some shit. And I'm like. I would have killed him. I don't, I'm sorry. I would have killed him on the spot. I now you know what it would be like to be married to me. Like moving is already stressful. We have to fucking move. There is nothing. I don't care what anybody says. Moving is worse than a root canal. There's not many things that I that Browns girl hate more than moving. I will live in a place I hate instead of moving. I don't know what is wrong. I hate it. I cannot stand moving. I cannot stand it. It's why I don't paint my walls because I already hate moving. And if I have to paint my walls when I move out, that you're just adding a multiplier to the to the misery points, okay? So can you imagine you're sitting here stressfully packing up your apartment and and you're out of box tape, which of course you need box tape to tape up your boxes, right? And you ask your boyfriend or girlfriend or partner or whatever to go get some and they come back three hours later drunk with scotch tape. Tell me you wouldn't murder them. Tell Nah. So like this is one of the most realistic fights I've ever seen. I would have lost my fucking shit, dude. I would have been like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm sitting here packing up our shit like a psychopath and you're at the bar? I would love to also have a drink. You know who would love to have a drink? Me. I would also like to have a drink. You know what a decent person would do? They would help me pack our shit up so we can go have a drink together at the bar. Okay? That would be nice. I, Because, you know, that would be the non-selfish, non-shitty, non-dickhead thing to do. But you're a piece of shit. Anyways, the main character of this book is a total piece of shit. And, which makes it... Listen. Which makes it so hard because there is an eldritch being in this child's closet. <laughs> there is something in this kid's closet and it is horrifying. It is actually fucking horrifying. 
and the you know the kid is having nightmares and all this stuff because there's some cthulhu type of thing in his closet and he keeps telling his mom and dad like yo there's something in the closet it's really really it's creepy creepy i can't go to bed i can't sleep because there's something in the closet and <laughs> i'm just gonna this is my plug for why you should read issue one the dad's like don't worry kiddo we're gonna move and you're never gonna have to worry about this closet again and the kid goes to sleep he's like he can't sleep and he sees this demon thing that's like I'm moving too. I'm coming with you. <laughs> and I was like, ah! 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 <laughs> I was like, no, no, why are you moving? <laughs> no, don't come with him. But that being said, I really want the bat on the cover. Tell me that's not the cutest little bat plush you've ever seen. So if anybody watching this, you know, my P.O. Box information is down below. If you know how to make plushies and you want to send me one of these, I will put it back here and cherish it forever because that's like the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. OK. All right. Next book. This is completely on the opposite side of the spectrum. OK, but it's it's great. Uh, also by Image Comics. Can you tell Image was really just loved loved what they were putting out this past month the me you love in the dark i didn't like this comic and then it grew on me and i'll i'll tell you why what's interesting about this comic is it's about an artist who's trying to find inspiration and goes and lives in a haunted house to try to see if that drums anything up or shakes anything loose. And it's like a rom-com meet cute between a artist who's having trouble making art and a dead person and a ghost. I kind of like it. Does she get possessed? Hasn't happened yet, but who's to say, you know, things won't change. Next one, which is kind of my all-star for the week. You you cannot be surprised here. You, you really, really cannot be surprised here because I'm such a fangirl. Batman Fortress. I love Batman. It's, it's a problem, you know? So many people are like, oh, but Doctor Strange is your fave. It's like, yeah, but I also like Constantine. And it's like, what about Iron Man? I'm like, but I also like Batman. Like, I, I think for me, DC is a hair above Marvel Comics. It's not a it's not a huge gap, but it there's there's some space there. I love DC Comics and DC comic characters. And in some ways I feel like the animated and print material is so much better than what Marvel puts out. I just wish we got more decent DC movies, you know, like Shazam. Who knows? Maybe Black Adam will blow us all away. I hope it does because The Rock as Black Adam is definitely blowing me away. We're also gonna watch some footage of The Rock as Black Adam making his appearance at San Diego Comic-Con because y'all, he made an entrance. He was really showing his WWE roots, okay? At that bronze girl, Bratman is too rich and privileged. Coley, you don't even know how to spell privileged, so just have several seats, okay, honey? Sometimes we don't need to type. Sometimes we can just watch. So Batman Fortress involves like an alien threat that has essentially created a blackout over the city. And all of the power is out. And Batman has to go through and kind of help everyone. And Superman is missing. All of the villains have busted out of Arkham Asylum. Things are, things are very bad. But what I like about it is the way Batman is kind of uh, portrayed coming into this series. I actually want to show a really cool frame where there's all of these people that are kind of looting and stuff. And the assumption is like, well, Batman's going to swoop in and beat them up, right? And Batman actually says like, well, no, that's what insurance is for. I'm not going to go beat up a bunch of people smashing store shops. It doesn't even matter, really. I'm here to save people's lives. I don't care if property gets destroyed, their insurance will cover it. But y'all, the the writer would have fucking popped off in this panel. I wasn't expecting it, but I loved it. He says, in my father's day, 
The American dream used to mean something. An honest wage for honest work. Food on the table. Liberty and justice for all. Now it's an illusion. A carrot on a stick. Attainable by a few. Dangled just out of reach for everyone else. A bigger TV. A faster car. Shiny objects to keep the masses distracted while the world around them burns. You want to blame them for grabbing the carrot when the lights go out? Go ahead, but don't look to me to stop them. I love this Batman. This Batman is speaking my language. He still beats the ever-living shit out of people, which I'm here for. There's actually a, another panel where um, he's in Crime Alley and he sees somebody shoot two people and he complete like he literally says he doesn't go to this part of town because his PTSD is so bad he'll fly off the handlebars. He completely brutalizes the person that kills these two people. But what I like is that he has that kind of personal responsibility going into it, if that makes sense, you know? Like he's a Batman that is very flawed, very broken, very much hurting, but I feel like also knows that. And because of that, I love him. It's such a gritty, uh, dark comic rooted in reality. And I know that a lot of you Marvel fans are probably cringing. You're probably like, why does everything have to be gritty and dark? Here's my question to you. Why does everything have to be funny? Personally, I would like a little bit of range. I liked the new Batman film precisely because it did it wasn't so marvelly, you know? I don't understand why everything has to be funny for you people. I understand not everything has to be dark. I agree personally, you know? You know what I love chasing my Peaky Blinders binge with? Some what we do in the shadows. Why? Because variety is the spice of life. So after reading a bunch of jokey campy comics, I love coming into Batman Fortress and getting a little bit, just a dose of reality. I really liked this book. It was a lot of fun. I liked it a lot. All right, now it's time for our next segment, our backlog attack log. So I have a stack, because I felt burnt out on comics for a while. I have a stack, well, no, that's a lie. A stack is underselling it. I have like three long boxes of comics that I have not read. <sighs> so every single week I try to dive into that pile and I have been making really good progress. The downside is sometimes I find something I wanna talk about and it's several months old. And that's why I bring you my backlog attack log. Now. I might talk about some comics that are four or five months old, but here's the thing about that. Here's the thing about that. If you have Steam games in your Steam library that you haven't played, you don't get to fucking drag me for reading a comic that's four months old and just now getting to it, right? Let's just, you know, reserve our judgment and accept that sometimes it's hard to keep up with a hobby, okay? Because, yeah, it is hard to keep up with all of our hobbies. So if you have books, if you have a stack of books on your shelf that you haven't read, or if you have a stack of comics that you haven't read, or if you have some Steam games you haven't beaten, but you're buying more on the Steam Summer Sale, you know, maybe just take that judgment and just, you know, just enjoy this segment. Okay, I finally got around to reading Static Season 1 by DC Comics. Beautiful, amazing, amazing, amazing art, okay? Right off of the, right out of the gate though, I have to say something. Static belongs to a group of heroes that obtain their powers from you're not gonna believe this. They're like at a protest and the police launch this crazy gas and they all become, and I was like, so basically janky in human storyline. Okay, interesting. But here's what's wild. Here's the part you're not gonna believe. Guess what they call the people that got their supernatural abilities from this gas? They call them bang babies. Why are we calling them bang babies? That's a, do you, has anybody ever wanted the word bang? and baby in the same sentence. I don't know about y'all, I, I, never, I never wanted that. So why they chose to name them, you know, Bang Babies, I don't know. Um, full disclosure, Static Shock was not something I was familiar with prior to this, okay? 
So maybe this is just one of those things that hasn't aged well, you know? I, I was into a lot of superheroes growing up. Static Shock wasn't one of them. Um, primarily because I never saw that show when it was on. The comics, they've been few and far between for a few years now. Like, I feel like we would get one comic here, a one shot here, like a small limited series there. But um, in my time of reading comics, I basically started at the worst time possible with DC Comics. I started with the New 52, and I feel like there was Static Shock for a small period of time there, but at that point I was reading a lot more Marvel than I was reading DC for obvious reasons. You know, New 52. Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience with Static Shock. So I understand that this is their, you know, chat's informing me this has been their name forever. So, you know, you'll have to apologize. For me, coming into this with no nostalgia, naming them Bang Babies is wild. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> of all the things to like change or retcon about Static Shock, we need to change this name. I'm sorry. Bang Babies is not... It's, it's not a great name. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's not making me think of what they want me to think of, okay? So that aside, how did I feel about the comic? Overall, I actually really liked it. I feel like he has like this really cool family and it's this character that's trying to balance like their anger, their anger issues or their like trying to manage like going for the first option or the easiest um, sort of option against making a smart choice. The reason I say that is like, that's something I deal with. A lot of times anger is the easiest emotion to feel. It's a lot more difficult to feel hurt uh, or sad or something, you know, betrayed, embarrassed. Anger is a much easier, safer emotion to feel for a lot of us. And that's something that this character uh, struggles with or wrestles with in the comics. I actually did really like that. The other thing I finally caught up with is I'm finally caught up with Miss Marvel. Guys, I'm just going to say it. This is my spicy take of the day. These have been ass since G. Willow Wilson's run. I don't know what happened. What the fuck is going on, fam? What the fuck is going on? Okay, so there are a lot of good Dissy references. Like, I will say that these comics are 10 times more accurate than anything that Disney Plus has put out. I do like the Dissy references they put in. They feel more natural and... Uh, more accurate than anything that is put in a in, in, in the Disney Plus show. Um, at one point, she actually refers to Balushai, which made me like very emotional because Balushai is my favorite dessert. And it was on the list of things I actually asked my dad to bring me back from Punjab since he's over there right now. He said, do you want me to bring you back anything? And I said, Balushai. So seeing Miss Marvel talk about it, like that's that kind of stuff is really dope, even though there's very few people that probably get that or appreciate that. I appreciate it. This comic did something that I find, I just am like, I will always find unforgivable. I thought we were gonna get Loki in a Dissy wedding. I really thought that this was gonna happen. I thought, oh my gosh, look at Loki on the elephant in a Dissy wedding. Loki isn't even in this comic. He's not even in it. They did the they did the thing that they fucking always do where they just like debate it and it's like a vision or a dream or a illusion and I'm like so it's a dream it's a dream sequence I we can't even have Loki and a Shadowani and here's the thing did they put Wolverine on the cover of the very first Miss Marvel run yes but do you want to know what else he was in the comics Wolverine is in those comic books and same thing with Lockjaw. So I just can't, I understand that the, the covers aren't always an accurate portrayal of what is inside. I've been reading comics for a while, so like, fam, I get that. But what I hate is when they put a character on the cover that's not even there. That is fucked up. That is fucked up. Where it's like, okay, if you show something happening on the cover that's not going to happen, I get it. I understand. But this, Loki had nothing to do with the comic at all. No bearing on the plot, no, like nothing. And I was just like, 
That's rude. You know, I feel like that very rarely happens. And if you're going to do that, here's the thing. Just do a variant. Am I crazy? Like, you know, just maybe this is a variant. Am I? No, it's it's not. Okay, so just do a variant or something. When they put a character on the cover that's not in the comic, I need at least a cameo. I need at least a whiff, you know? Like, there needs to be at least, like, something in there where they're at the end and they're like, hey, Miss Mar- something, okay? The other thing is that in this comic, they have a very strange, very convoluted explanation of Miss Marvel's powers that just doesn't even need to be there. Like, they, they, I don't know why they feel like, we need to explain how this works. And I'm like, girl, no, you don't. Please stop. It's like the midi-chlorian force thing from Star Wars. They also keep doing this thing with Miss Marvel Comics that I can't stand, which is this, like, ham-fisted explanation of what heroes are. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. G. Willow Wilson already nailed that in her run with Miss Marvel, okay? At this point, we got to start developing her in other ways. We can't just keep doing this like, what does it mean to be a hero? Like, that's going to happen naturally, right? But you need to give her some, like, journey other than that. Whether that's, you know, trying to balance being from an immigrant family in America, whether that's trying to navigate who she is once she graduates high school, like, you know, uh, something. But I think rehashing this same thing over and over again uh, is kind of just like, for me, not cute. I'm not into it. The last comic I wanted to talk about, it's been sitting on the stack forever and I, I had to force myself to read it. Stranger Things, Dungeons and Dragons. I had to force myself to read this. I really did. Because I was sure it was going to be bad. I, I don't know why I was sure it was going to be bad. But I was like, this comic is probably going to be ass. Okay. I actually ended up really liking it. This comic is about how the boys from the show get into D&D. And it actually had a lot of cute things in it that I really ended up liking. One of the things was like the little nods that let you know that the writers play D&D. Like, these kids go for months and years between sessions. Tell me that's not realistic. Tell me that's not realistic. So I thought the I thought for some reason the comic was just going to be their campaign as a D&D session, but it's not. The comic actually covers them and their journey with Dungeons & Dragons, which is actually a really interesting premise. And one of the things I love is that as a DM, Mike is kind of the forever DM which I think is like, once again, very true to life. You know, once someone starts DMing, they kind of, you know, keep DMing. And, you know, they start out kind of like sticking to the rules and kind of figuring out how to use the rules to facilitate gameplay, which is such a big part of D&D, &D, which is like someone wants to do something, but how do you use the rules to make that make sense and make it fair? Um, and I think it actually highlighted like why people have a sort of natural tendency to to gatekeep. I don't think it always comes from a place of maliciousness. I think it's one of those things where it's like, oh, we play this thing a certain way with these rules in place. And then, you know, the, the scenario that happens in this comic is so such a real life scenario, which is like someone brings their girlfriend to the table that's not into it at all. And then suddenly you start to feel really defensive about it because there's someone sitting there criticizing it, you know, or that's not into it. Or you have to change the whole game to get that person into it, you know, or they're bored the entire time they're there. But I kind of liked watching them like work through that and eventually become like a very welcoming like dope table that plays this game um even though the events of the various seasons of stranger things are happening in the background uh in the foreground they even discuss that like who the hell wants to sit down and play this game after we've killed the demogorgon or whatever and the answer is they do they still want to do it because it's just this like fun thing they can escape into and it ended up being actually a very cute comic book about these young boys' adventure with D&D. &D. 
and how they fall in love with it. I, I literally put it I put it off for months because I was like, oh, I'm not gonna like this. And I didn't I didn't just like it. So we gotta talk a little bit about the boys. I wanted to talk about it specifically. I wanted to talk about how this show is so much better than this book. <laughs> I tried to read this book several years ago after reading Preacher. I loved Preacher and I was like, well, what else do Preacher fans recommend? And um, I tried to read The Boys and I couldn't. And it's not because I was offended or grossed out. Um, it was really just because it was edgy for the sake of being edgy. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute here. When the show got announced, I was like, okay, now, now is the time for me to finally get the trade paperback and try to do it again. Okay. So I bought the trade paperback and I made a second attempt and I did read the entire first volume, which I think these are the first, I think eight comics, this show has taken source material that was very mid and created what I would say is an S tier show, which is not easy to do. That is actually very difficult to do. It's very easy to get amazing source content and make an okay show. It's very hard to take just just a crappy source material and make a show as good as this one. And I want to talk a little bit about what changes they made for me that made this show go to that level. Something I really just couldn't fucking get over in the comic was how they write Kimiko. It, it they literally she doesn't even have a name. They call her the female of the species. And for short, they call her the female. And it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, she is arguably one of the most interesting members of the boys. And she's treated as this side character, this throwaway character, that's kind of this silent, you know, weapon that's thrown at problems that they have. And she solves them in some ways. She's just violent. She works for the mob and she rips people's faces off and jams it up their asses. Her narrative through this series has been, in many ways, some of the most heart-wrenching stuff I've seen, you know, in a, in a superhero show. I use the word, I use the term very loose. Especially in this last season, spoilers, by the way. There's gonna be spoilers for the latest season of The Boys in this show. Please do not complain to me about it later. This is your warning. As soon as you see this logo go off the screen, then you'll know you can come back. But in this season, she struggles with not wanting her powers anymore because they have caused her to become almost basically a monster. In so many ways, she wants to live a normal life, but because she has these abilities, somebody either always wants her to kill somebody or someone is always trying to kill her. And she gets the rare opportunity of having those powers taken from her. And then she struggles with wanting them back. She has this horrible realization that the things that matter most to her, she can't protect if she doesn't have her powers. There is not a narrative that interesting in, in this. One of the main things I actually hated about this book when I read it was that I always thought they were hypocritical. I always thought Butcher in the comic, not in the show, was a fucking hypocrite. For someone that hates soups and thinks that soups needs to be brought to heel and all this stuff, he, butt chugs compound v like it's going out of style you know he at no point thinks that that's hypocritical or shitty or 
you know, makes him a piece of shit in any way, shape, or form. In the show, this is an actual conversation that happens. First of all, the show takes, what is it, four seasons to introduce Temp V. In the comic, that happens basically right out of the gate. For this reason, I think the show has higher stakes. Because essentially, it's four normal humans and their super-powered friend going up against superheroes. That is terrifying. Because at any point in time, they can get annihilated by, by Translucent or, or Black Noir or any of the people they're dealing with. And yet, somehow, they outsmart, outmaneuver, outplan, and outgun their enemies every single time. And that's what makes them the fucking boys. This is not what it was like in the comic. In the comic, they all shoot up and snort V, get superpowers, and then go beat up superheroes. This, this was never compelling for me. I'm sorry. Because to me, it was like, well, then aren't they just superheroes? At the, at the end of the day, aren't they just the same thing then? You know? Like, like if, if they are the boys and they're going after superheroes, but they're injecting superpowered serum, aren't they really the same thing that they're fighting? Like, what's really the difference? That they have great value powers? Like, come on. But the show... The show... I loved that they don't have Temp V for the first few seasons. I loved it. Because there's real stakes, you know? Like they, like I said, they actually have to outsmart, outthink their enemies at every turn. Because they're dealing with people that can, that can punch their heads off, right? And now that the Temp V has finally been introduced, we now deal with, there's two writing changes they made that I absolutely love, okay? One, is that in the in the comic book, Butcher does not give Huey a choice about taking the Temp V. Butcher grabs the Temp V and, and jams it in Huey, and Huey never has the option of saying yes or no there. In this one, Huey takes it on his own, which once again makes him such, such an interesting just character because at the point they've done such a good job of writing his relationship with starlight and writing his relationship with the boys where he constantly feels like mother's milk and frenchie and everyone else has like a use and he doesn't they do such a good job of bringing this all together that by the time he takes the v you're actually you kind of understand why he would do it the entire institution he basically helped found the government organization that he's working with that he's making a change with he's just found out that they are in the pocket of Vaught, that it's run by you know another super super abled person and that basically all of the work he's been doing is just bullshit at that point in time I can't definitively say I wouldn't take the compound V. Absolutely, absolutely love that facet of this. Also, ugh, there's just the sex scenes in this are stupid too. Sorry, I, I just can't stand. Like he's having sex with this lady from the FBI or the CIA and it's just multiple scenes of them fucking each other and hating each other and it makes no sense at all. Where I'm like, why would you wanna have sex with somebody that hates you and that you hate? Maybe it's a kink I don't understand, but like, it's, it's like nothing about it is hot. Like, do you, I don't know. Does she look like she's having a good time? Uh, to, to me, she doesn't. Does she look like she's having a good time chat? She's like, Ugh! I'm like, yeah, everyone knows that's what women look like during sex, right? <laughs> like, yeah, so fucking weird. This comic is so fucking weird. Let's talk about some of my favorite things that they did with the boys this season. One of my favorite bits, the entire bit with Black Noir and the cartoons. Can I just say I loved this? This was like my favorite thing ever. The nonverbal storytelling here on just is second to none. Just absolutely second to none. Like, 
When you have a character that doesn't talk according to your canon, you know, how do you have an exposition dump without having an exposition dump? And the way this show did it was absolutely phenomenal. It was so good. It was so amazing. I loved that they basically have these cartoon characters that represent Black Noir psyche that come in and are and recap the story for the audience and basically tell you what he's thinking. So good. So utterly amazing. Just so absolutely amazing. This was one of my favorite scenes of, of any show ever. It was so creative. It was so different. There was some bravery in it, like because it was such a strong art choice. It was such a strong visual decision, st style decision, and it paid off in in spades for me. It also made me feel really bad for him, you know, for a character who we didn't know much about. It made me feel bad for him very quickly. It did more to establish or develop that character than seasons of what Marvel does with Disney Plus shows. There is a scene where the legend talks about America and it is absolutely amazing. It's in episode five, I wanna say. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Apparently it pissed a lot of people off, which I thought was really funny because as they say, a hit dog will holler. So, you know, if, if you're one of these people, it's like, oh, you know, the boys got too political this this season. Here's the thing. The boys has always been political at, at its core. The boys is about the commodification and the capitalization of superheroes and how in a real life scenario, they wouldn't be out there doing good and, and serving the best, you know, cause. They would be serving governments. And because governments and businesses and companies are inherently political, therefore superheroes are political, right? Like, the entire premise and concept of the boys has always been a political one. Homelander has never been a good guy. I think the biggest change between Homelander from the comic to the show, in my opinion, is that Homelander in the show is a lot less competent than Homelander in the comic book. In the comic book, Homelander like almost understands that this is a business, that they have an image to protect. Like he talks about profiles and points a lot and, and how that determines the rankings of different superheroes. But in the show, it's almost like he doesn't really understand these things he views himself as like a member of like a new Aryan kind of race you know and that therefore he's entitled he should not have to care about what normal humans think about him which is funny because this is something Butcher says in the first issue of the comic book in the comic book Butcher says that the second that superheroes start to realize that number one there's so many of them and that number two they don't really have to fight for the approval of the masses they could just eliminate them that that would be a problem for humans out, uh, on large and and what's crazy is that that's kind of homelander's narrative they just do a better job with it in this comic he starts out or in the show sorry he starts out in episode one or in season one kind of with his biggest fear being people not liking him, people hating him, and losing this fame and gravitas that he has because the number one thing he wants out of life, more so than anything else, is love. He wants to be adored, he wants to be admired, he wants to be loved, he wants to be respected. As the seasons wear on, that starts to like erode and fall apart because he's projecting an image of himself or a version of himself that just isn't true. It doesn't match with what's on the inside. He's doing things to try to get people's approval versus, you know, genuinely getting their approval and admiration. So we see in season two, his arc kind of begins to come around to this sense or feeling that well, he's better than people, so it's stupid that he exists in an environment where he has to care about them. And then we see him doubling down on that in season three, which ultimately leads for such 
a compelling narrative for Homelander that in some ways, you know, he's terrifying, but you also find yourself almost pitying him because he is such a pathetic character, but also a terrifying one, which is true of most people, you know? Most pathetic people are, uh, it, well, some pathetic people are in a lot of ways terrifying because they're pathetic, because they have nothing to lose, because they, you know, those are the people that are most frightening. 3220 for episode five. Thank you. You're the best. You are actually the best. Okay. Yeah, and they call them the good old days. The thing is, to be American means knowing you're the hero. So what do we do? We sweep all our filthy shit under the rug, and we tell ourselves a myth like Soldier Boy, and I get stinking rich selling it. Now, the entire show has moments like this in it, where it actually starts to talk about things that are relevant in America today. Topics that could make people feel a little bit uncomfortable, but is that really so far from the truth? I'm not saying, oh, Americans should hate America. I'm saying no other country that I've lived in at least, granted I've only lived in two, has this obsession with being the protagonist. Right? We have these conversations on stream a lot where I ask people who are from other countries like what their upbringing is like, you know? I remember asking if in the UK, if they talk about, you know, colonialism and how they, how they, you know, destroyed Africa and India, you know, created all of the, you know, uh, hardship with the partition, caused wars, you know? Oftentimes I think about, okay, well, how does that figure into the education system. Is it talked about, you know, in Germany, do they talk about the Holocaust? Do they talk about Nazis? Do they talk about World War II and how do they cover it? And in large part, it's because in America, there is this tendency to always try to make America look like the good guy versus covering history as it is. And that obsession to make America always look like the good guy is part of why people cannot now accept actually teaching real history. It's like, well, we, we, well, well if we actually teach history as it is, it'll make America look bad. I mean, no, it won't. Young Americans, they'll, they'll hate America. No, they will know the, the foundation upon which America was built. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing to know. I think that's an important thing to know. Moving forward into the future with ignorance about the past, basically what it does is it makes you ill-equipped to understand how things have gotten to where they are now. If you watched Miss Marvel and you were like, I don't really understand why India and Pakistan hate each other, it's so weird. And then you go back in history and find out why, then it makes a lot more sense. And it equips you to better understand that issue or have empathy for it or have understanding for it, right? We can't begin to talk about indigenous rights and, and pipelines that are being built and all these things until we are equipped with a solid understanding of the historical injustices that have been inflicted on that community. Just because you have forgotten does not mean they have. And I say that as a Punjabi Desi person, you know, uh, that lived in, in Punjab for 10 years of my life, you know, just because, oh, everyone else has forgotten and moved on, we still remember. We still remember Operation Blue Star. We still remember the partition. We still remember the Mughal Empire forcibly converting Hindus and Sikhs by torturing them into Islam. We remember. Just because everyone else has forgotten doesn't mean that we have forgotten. And it, it, it is from how can we begin to have a conversation with another party that doesn't know and doesn't care to know. Knowledge of where you live is important. I never thought that for even for a second that a show about superheroes would bring that in. But that's essentially what The Boys has done. It has brought in conversations I never thought we would be having 
and it's contextualized them for modern day America. That's what comic books have always done. You know, there might be some glue huffer, eraser eating idiot in my chat that is like, oh, it's too political or back in politics. Comics have always been political. Look at the X-Men. Comics have always been a way of making sense of the world around us. This is one of the first shows I've seen that has modernized that for 2022. The things they talk about like media literacy, extreme patriotism, like, you know, nationalism that flies in the face of of things like freedom, of things like simple education. All of these things are actually addressed in the show and addressed in a way that I really liked. Long story short, overall, were there a couple of places where I wasn't the biggest fan of season three? Eh, maybe. But overall, I love season three. And I can't understand how a show keeps getting better and better with each season. And yet somehow, here we are. I know a lot of people felt very negatively about the finale. I didn't. I actually liked it. And I'm excited for the next season of The Boys. Uh, this has become one of my favorite shows of all time. Is it hyper violent? Yes, but I love that shit. Is it grimy and just nasty? Yes, but I kind of like that too. It's a refreshing change. And I absolutely, absolutely love this show. And I love the type of story it's telling and how it's flipped the script on a comic book that in my opinion was mid. You know, like the comic was so lackluster. I never imagined they could take the premise from the comic and make such an amazing show. And it's somehow put into words nasty feelings I've felt about Marvel for a long time. There's a scene where where <laughs> Kimiko and Frenchie go to Vought World and they have like LGBT, what is it? LGBT tacos, BLM burritos, B or BLM BLTs, Brave Maves Pride Lasagna. And I was like, oh my fucking God, this is, this is what Marvel does now. And here's what's crazy. People lap that shit up. They fucking lap that shit up. Marvel can edit uh, you know, uh, gay people out of their out of their movies when they release them in foreign countries. They can they can do all that stuff. They put one pride flag in or one kiss in. You people lap that shit up. You're like, oh my god, Marvel. Oh my god, this representation, Marvel. Like it's so desperate for a crumb of fucking representation, which you know that's your right. That will allow like just about fucking anything from Disney, anything to slide, and the boys completely shits on that where it shows the ruthless the ruthless like commodification and uh exploitation of every woke concept literally they're like okay blm how do we make money off it we, they want they want gay shit okay put a put a fucking uh put a fucking rainbow on a goddamn shirt and charge them 30 dollars for it they're idiots they'll buy it what do we what do we do what do we do what do we do here because these people are morons. So how do we get these, you know, uh, drugged masses to just come through and buy all of this stupid shit because we don't care actually about any of these people. And the show does it in a way that it's like, if you don't see it when you start, hopefully you will start seeing that stuff in media when you're done watching the show. It does, it does such a good job of making fun of that type of shit. One of the other really good, really amazing writing changes they did from the comic that I absolutely adore is Mother's Milk and his relationship with his daughter. MM has such a great, such a better relationship with his daughter on, in the show than he does in the comic. And that is something else that is like, you know, like for a comic called The Boys, you would think that in the comic, there would be more focus and love and attention paid, not just to Butcher and Huey, but to all of the boys, right? 
And this show, especially in season three, really hits that on the head. You know, in so many ways, by the end of it, you don't like Butcher. Like, M.M., Frenchie, Kimiko, they're the heart of the show. And in some ways, you need to see them win. And you hate that they're kind of chained to this asshole with no moral compass. If you haven't seen season three, I highly encourage giving it a shot because it's just absolutely amazing and it delivers drama suspense action and gore and it does it all effortlessly and i absolutely love it ba -da -ba -ba -ba! it's time for my joyless nerd moment. Now, this segment is inspired by the fact that anytime I say anything negative about anything, uh, people tend to say that I am a a joyless, joyless fucking nerd, okay? Even though you've just listened to me talk about things I enjoy for two hours, um, you know, this is still going to be called the joyless nerd moment because in honor of the mouth breathing neck beards. I'm gonna keep this, I'm gonna keep this relatively short. This show wasn't great. <laughs> ah! This show wasn't great at all. It was, as the kids say, mid. And I'm not saying that from the perspective of, oh, I'm Punjabi and I actually speak the language the character speaks and therefore I have insight that you don't have, which is true. I have insight that you don't have. But I'm speaking strictly from a show perspective in terms of pacing, in terms of writing, in terms of coherency in the plot. Girl, it, what the fuck? What the fuck was this even? What the hell was this show even? And I feel like the only reason people are defending it so much is because they want to feel like it's, it's the boys thing. They want to feel good in their fifis, you know? Where it's like, but bronze, this show is so important for dizzy women, desi women. And um, it's a Hallmark show. And, um, you know, it's just something that's like really special and it's so different and there's nothing really like it in the Marvel cinematic universe. And, you know, it's really sad that you didn't really get that. There was potential there for there to be something good. But I will say with my whole chest, here's two things that are popping out. This was white people. Y'all wouldn't be saying this. And number two, y'all think everything Dissy people do is cute because you've been laughing at our accent for 10 years. Let's call a spade a spade. Like, you know, and I could, I could go out there and be like, Hello everybody, how are you doing today? My name is That Bronze Girl and I'm going to be talking about the Marvel comics. And you'd be like, oh my God, I love her. She's so cute. I love her. Cause you guys have been laughing at our accents for like 40, 50 years. When people were sitting here saying, oh, the love story was so good. The love story happened in 30 seconds and wasn't very good at all like the camera panned that was the love story it's like oh hey she meets this guy and she's sleeping in his rose field and then it the camera pans around and she's pregnant and i was like that's your love story okay or the fact that they kept talking about the partition for three episodes and the partition actually didn't really have any bearing on the plot as a whole. Other than, I guess, she went back in time to save herself and or save her own grandmother? So... What, what 
does that even mean? What did that do to further her character? Or the thing that annoys me the most that they acknowledge in the plot. She goes from having no knowledge of how to use her powers to being an expert with no on-screen explanation of how that happened. How, girl, how, how does that happen? Does this show have some good moments? Eh, yeah, I guess it does. But overall, I don't think I would have even finished it if it weren't for the fact that I'm on a podcast where I have to watch it. It's sad because this is one of my favorite comic book characters. I really wanted her to knock it out of the park. Unfortunately, it's just not very good. I'm Punjabi and I'm saying that. I actually recently took a DNA test and found out that I'm more Pakistani than I am Indian, you know? And I think part of it is, and this is where we get into the joyless, you know, the joyless nerd moment of it. I'm not one of those people that watches things and is like, guys, just turn your brain off. I shouldn't have to turn my brain off for something to be good. I didn't have to turn my brain off to enjoy Loki. I didn't have to turn my brain off to enjoy Iron Man. I didn't have to turn my brain off to enjoy Endgame. And now you guys are complaining that I need to turn my brain off. Fam, I don't go into things thinking, ah, yes, I'm looking forward to disliking this. I'm not a hater. I typically go into things like very neutral, like, oh, I hope this is somewhat decent, you know? I would like for this to be decent. I don't pick apart the plots of AAA movies, you know, of these big blockbusters, these big summer action films. I don't care. But they need to be entertaining. They need to make sense at a minimum. And I don't think that's a lot to ask for, you know? If I'm looking at my watch during an episode or during a movie, I mean, that's not me like hyper analyzing, like, oh my God, Miss Marvel's powers are actually not. No, that's just like, what am I watching? Why am I here? So what exactly was supposed to be the turn my brain off enjoyment moment of it? I guess I was supposed to be like, oh, but she's a Pakistani girl and she's, this is the role of a lifetime. Okay, cool. I'm happy for her. Doesn't mean I want to watch the show because the show is not very good. Like, I'm happy she got her check. I'm happy she's thriving. But that doesn't mean her show's good. <laughs> I'm not going to use that as a justification for the show, you know? I can be happy that she got her first acting gig and got her check and still say the acting was wooden in a lot of places and, you know, the show was was not great. God, sorry. The more I think about it, the more it's just like... I already, I've, I've already discussed what I don't like about it so I'm not gonna get into it again but there's like there's no part of the show that makes sense to me I don't even know why she goes to Pakistan like I legitim I legitimately don't know like it's like beta you have to come to Pakistan and then they show up there and it's never actually discussed like why her grandmother asks her to come to Pakistan like they, they never talk about like why she goes and you're like what <laughs> Like, what? like, why did she go to Pakistan? The red daggers are in the show for like 30 seconds and they know everything, but they don't actually show it. Literally, the literally the plot of the show reads like somebody was like, listen, this is our one chance to make a Marvel show. We have Disney money. I think we should go to Pakistan, you know, show people the motherland, you know, but also just like show how evil Pakistani people are while we're there, you know? So how do we do that? Because her cousins are assholes to her for no discernible reason. Like, she has two cousins that she's visiting that go from, like, Hey, Kamala! Oh, you're still short! To, like, abandoning her in a bazaar. They literally abandon her for no discernible reason. They're just, like, evil, I guess. I don't know why. If you were gonna show this culture, you could have done a better job than that. Even the wedding scene was mid. Garachi was shot in Thailand. So they're, okay, so they didn't even shoot it on location? You know what, though? You know what I'm gonna say as a Pakistani? I wouldn't let those bitches in my country to shoot either. <laughs> I would have read the script. I would have been like, you have 
her dad saying chakka de fatte in episode two for no discernible reason this is your script yeah yeah you're not shooting here what yeah we're not allowing you into the country of pakistan the dance number in your wedding episode sucks your main red daggers boy his accent is the worst pakistani accent i've ever heard so um not only am i not letting you in the country to shoot you're actually banned i'm taking away your visas you can't come here anymore because with that accent with that horrible accent mr knight whatever his fucking name is aramis knight i'm sorry you're not you're you're get your card is revoked your brown card is revoked I know you're biracial. Get used to being white because the brown part, it's gone. I'm sorry. I'm taking it back. But then again, I'm pretty sure I'm more Pakistani than literally the entire cast of Miss Marvel because most of the actors are South Indian. They're from Mumbai. As uh, s Since I'm more Pakistani than the entire cast, uh, I will take this moment to let the cast know if you guys ever need help c getting coached in your Punjabi, um, I'm more than happy to help you, uh, because unlike you, I actually spent 10 years of my life over in Punjab and therefore, uh, actually know how to read and write it. So, you know, fuck it. I'm more Pakistani too. Hey, Balvin, you probably are actually <laughs> for part two of our joyless nerd segment, San Diego comic-con is is going on right now because uh san diego comic-con is is going on right now we we've found out that as soon as uh black panther drops that's it and the next that's phase five is after that okay after black panther we're in phase five and they've announced the phase five movies i would like to take this moment to say Phase four is the worst phase in Marvel history. <laughs> this is my joyless, <laughs> my joyless nerd moment of the day. It this is the worst phase in Marvel history. The it literally built to nothing. It's just a bunch of loose ends, you know. It's like they threw a bunch at the wall to try to see what would stick. There were no ramifications or anything about Eternals, and it came out two years ago. You know, what was the point of Eternals other than, I guess, just to make it? What was the point of it? Why Why did we need that? You know, I, I there was so much bad in phase four. It's just such a letdown from phase three and I have a theory now the even numbered phases will always be bad I I think phase five will be good like phase three was and phase six will be dog shit again this entire phase has felt like they're rushing to something you know it's like they're just rushing they're trying they're trying to get someplace, you know? And then once they get there, the next phase is really good, but the current phase is just is just not, you know. Phase 4 had so much and so much of it was not good. The runtime for phase 4 is more than phases 1 through 3 combined in terms of minutes like if you add up the minutes from all the movies all the shows everything it's more than phases one through three combined and i think it shows because the lack of quality is just astounding they have announced phase five of marvel however you know uh as of today we've got quantum mania secret invasion guardians of the galaxy echo the marvels i i don't have high hopes for that show uh <laughs> that movie loki blade iron heart daredevil born again which has 18 episodes which is kind of cool uh agatha coven of chaos actually i have really good hopes for that one too captain america new world order and thunderbolts so none of this is actually very surprising 
Most of this, I believe, was already announced. And what wasn't announced makes sense based off of where they were leading in episode or in phase four. I'm mid for Quantum Mania. Kind of same for Guardians. I'm not excited one way or another. I'm not at all excited for Secret Invasion, Echo, the Marvels at all whatsoever. Not at all excited. Ironheart, I'm mid on. I am excited out of my mind for Loki. Blade, Daredevil, and Thunderbolts. Those, those four, I am, is that five? Yeah, four. Those four, I'm incredibly excited for. Like, very, very invested. I love Charlie Cox as Daredevil. I loved the Netflix series of Daredevil. I thought it was fantastic. Um, absolutely love him. Uh, Captain America, New World Order. I'm, I, I mean, Actually, if the show was any indication, I'm excited for that too, but I'm not at all excited for everything else. Some of them I'm actively unexcited for. Uh, some of these would be a miss for me. Like I said, if I wasn't, you know, a creator who uh, watches everything. I wouldn't have finished Miss Marvel if I wasn't on a podcast for it. I would have watched the first three episodes and stopped. And that's not me being a hater. It's just me being like, ah, I would have been like, ah, this isn't for me and, and moved on. But yeah, that that's kind of it. I guess I'll see y'all again in two weeks for issue two of Bagged and Boarded, where I will once again attack my backlog, talk about what's new and interesting, talk about whatever show I watched and dive into comic books. I don't know. I don't I don't know how to do this, but. That's it, we're back! Bagged and boarded is back. Seal it, slab it, put it in your long box. Bag and board it. <laughs>